Now, we've been talking about breaking cycles. Uh, we've talked about breaking the cycle of negative thinking. We've talked about breaking the cycle of uh, negative speaking. I believe thinking and speaking goes together, right? Um, and so now I want to continue. I've got two more in this series, two different topics in this series. And today I want you to open your Bibles to a to Daniel. I want you to go to Daniel for me, the book of Daniel. I I love Daniel's testimony. Powerful book, y'all. Yeah, powerful book. If you want to know, want to see how God works, you, you should read the book of Daniel. It, Daniel, it, it helps you uh, to see God in a lot of different ways. Amen. You see his power and his presence. Amen. Um, Daniel chapter 3. And we want to read verse 16, starting at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, I mean Abednego, I couldn't help myself, replied to the king. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. He's able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hands, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or going to worship the golden image that you have set up. I want to talk about this morning breaking the cycle of insecurity. Amen. Breaking the cycle of insecurity. An unusual thing happens to all of us at birth. We are all shaped by the people that take care of us. The kind of childhood you had, past traumas, recent experiences and failures, or rejection, loneliness, social anxiety, negative beliefs about yourself, perfectionism, or having a critical parent or partner can contribute to insecurity. As we grow up, we unconsciously adopt an integrated pattern of destructive thoughts. Man is born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Um, he is by nature a sinner. He gravitates towards the negative before the positive. If after 10 years you have to prove yourself, amen, or still have to prove that you're confident in what you do, then you have an insecurity problem. I wish I had somebody. The experiences we have in our early childhood, the people, our caretakers, the one who took us from from the from 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 our parents and cared for us, or even if, even if your parents would parent was the one that was caring from you, these are where the root of our insecurities lie as an adult. Yeah. Amen. Imagine a child being yelled at by a parent. You're spaced out. Can't you figure anything out on your own? Then imagine the negative comments, the attitudes parents express towards themselves. Amen. I look terrible. 
I'm fat. Amen. These attitudes don't even have to be verbalized to influence a child's self-esteem. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I am a Christian counselor. And I found that throughout the years of practicing, I found that most of the time, most people, doesn't matter how old they are, they struggle with the cycle of insecurity. And one of the ways that they use to compensate their insecurities is they use jokes, sarcasm. They say certain slick stuff on the side not to, to deflect. I don't have anybody? But as a believer, as a blood-bought believer, now the Bible says that we are new creatures in Christ. But there are some things that I've found that we bring into our Christian life. And that is insecurity. And today my, 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 my goal, my, my intentions this morning is to help you to, to look at the life of a person. Look at the life of a man, a young man at that. Who even at 16 years old, he was confident. He really had no insecurities. Because he had a good foundation. Do I have anybody? And you may be saying, Pastor, you know, it, it, it's too late for me. Amen. Because I've lived with this insecurities for a long time. But I want to say to somebody here today. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Great, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That you've been crucified with Christ. That it is no longer you who live, but Christ who is living in you gives you the strength. Many of us struggle with insecurities. The truth be told. Amen. We, we, we struggle with it, but we, we, we have not really dealt with it. Daniel here in this passage, he's about 17 years old. When he goes into Babylon, 16 to 17 years old, he goes into Babylon. He's brought into Babylon as a slave boy. He comes into Babylon and, 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 and I want to say at this age, his insecurities are being shaped. Do you not know that Satan wants to keep you questioning your identity? Do you not know that Satan wants you to always keep proving yourself so that you can be accepted? You know, do you know what we all really want? What do we all want? We want acceptance. We want to be, we want to hear every now and then, every now and then. Even a loner needs to be told, you're doing a good job, man. Are you with me? Daniel, who went through Amen. First of all, the trauma of going into Babylon. Second of all, the tragedy uh, that of being ripped away from his family. Come on, somebody. The Bible declares that when they took him, amen, uh, they ripped him away from his family at 16 years old. This young man is now being brought into a place where the language... The culture is all secular. And, and what the enemy wants to do, he wants us to be trained by the world. The Bible says that when they came into Babylon in, 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 in chapter 1, they, that what they did is they changed their name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was not their Hebrew name. That was the name that the world gave them. Can I tell you something? The world wants to change your name. And whenever you change a person's name, you're changing their identity. Do I have anybody? Amen. They used to call you Rocket Blaster or whatever they used to call you or Boo Thing or whatever they used to call you. But the bottom line is, amen, you got to tell them that ain't my name no more. Killer and uh, you know, bulldog or whatever they used to call you. But here's the thing. Right now, you got a new name. You know what your name is? Your name is Christian. 
Your last name is Christian. You got to remember, wherever you go, you carry the name of Jesus with you. Do I have anybody? But something interesting about Daniel, one of the things that you have to learn, and I want you men to listen up on this one. One of the things that saved Daniel was his upbringing. As a Jewish child, when a Jewish child begins to speak, listen to me real good. When a Jewish child begins to speak, the father of the home begins to teach him one verse of the Torah, even though he can't comprehend it, it builds an appreciation and respect for the word of God. Oh, y'all, ain't, y'all did y'all catch that? It builds an appreciation. From the moment he could say, da, da. The, the, the father starts speaking a verse into his life. Watch this. The age of three marks another milestone in his education because the child is then taught how to recite the morning blessings from the Torah, from the Word of God. The obligation to start training children to do the misfah begins somewhere between ages six and, and age nine, depending on the nature of the child. Can I ask you a question, fathers? How much word does your children know? Why it's quiet. Amen. How much word do they know? By age 13, and for a girl age 12, the child reaches what's called the bar mitzvah. You've heard of that. Respectfully, what the child now, at 13, he, he or she, and 12 for the girl, Girls are more mature than boys. Um, <laughs> at that point, they are classified as adults because they would have had the whole five books of the Bible memorized. I wish I had somebody. Can you imagine if we were to take a page from Daniel's book? Can you imagine if we would take some of the principal's parents, can, and even if you're single parents, can you imagine if you sit with your child every day and you say, you know what, we're going to go over one verse at a time. When my children were, re- when we were, when our children was little, every day we would drive to, drive to, to, to the daycare and they would read one proverb a day. They didn't read proverb about, about 30 times. Why? Because we wanted them to get acclimated and appreciated and appreciating the word of God. You see, I want to tell you what's going to help you. And if we're going to break the cycle, we have to look at how Daniel, how Daniel lived his life. And the reason why he lived the way he did. Come on, somebody. If you look, if you look at verse, if you look at something, if you look at verse eight of of chapter one, you find something there. Now, now this is why Daniel now at 16 in Babylon, away from his parents, could respond like this. Watch what he says. Listen, the the text says, but Daniel made up in his mind that he would not defile himself. Look at that. With the king's choice food, food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he may not, what? Defile himself. Not only did he have the word of God, But he had the principles of God. And then he applied the principles. He didn't just say, oh, I know that verse. Or I can recite that verse. Or I will train up a child in the way he must go. And when he's old, he'll depart from. No, he actually put into practice when his parents wasn't around. The word of God in his life. And he was successful in life. Because the next verse says what? Now God granted Daniel what? favor can i help somebody with something if you want to overcome your insecurities you got to know that you got god's favor that god's favor is with you but you got to do your part by applying the word of god listening to the word of god is one thing but when you leave the church you have to apply the word of god to your everyday living. Come on and say amen. 
Do I have anybody? Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. God grant, granted Daniel's favor. Now let me tell you what happened to Daniel. I'm going to fast forward to, to chapter 3, but watch this. He faced many threats. From chapter 1 to chapter 3, first of all, he was threatened because of the dream. Amen. He had all kinds of issues going on, but Daniel was a man who made up in his mind. I believe this. I believe this. I believe that you and I have to ask ourselves a question. Have we really made up in our minds that we're going to serve the Lord? Have we really made up in our minds whether or not we're going to be a fan of Jesus or a follower of Jesus? Because if you made up in your mind that you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you got to get ready for what comes next. Because persecution will come. Come on, somebody. The devil is not going to leave you alone, but you have the ammunition. Come on, somebody. You have the ammunition to overcome any obstacles that come your way. Do I have anybody? Chapter 2, he he, he, God, God gave him a special gift to interpret the dreams. Out of all the prophets they had, all of the seers that they had in, in, in Babylon, Daniel was the only one that God divinely gave that gift to and that saved his life. I'm, I'm going to share a little bit more. In chapter 3 now, here's a threat that comes against him. The threat that comes against him now is that he would abandon his God and bow down to an idol. How many of us, because we're so insecure in who we are, because we're not sure who we are, the, the Bible declares that in the last day, amen, in the book of Revelation, that some will take the mark of the beast. Some will take the mark of the beast. Some will not commit to living for God. Because they want to save their life. May I say this to you? You got to decide if you're willing to die for him. I know you want to live for him. But here's the thing. There's no crown without a cross. Come on somebody. And you got to realize something. That the enemy wants you to live in insecurities. He wants you to live in doubt. He wants you to live in fear. He wants you to say, man, I can't really trust God. If I hold on to this little bit that I have, if I give it to the Lord, what's going to happen? And he's going to have you vacillating. He's going to have you believing things that's not real. Are you with me? Daniel, chapter 3. We fast forward to chapter 3, verse 5. And what we find here is the command was given. That moment when you hear the sound, this is the, this is the command. Of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music. See, see, watch this now, watch this now. He says, when you hear this kind of music, See, there's a difference between worship music and music from Babylon. And, and, and when I did the study on this, these, these instruments is what they would use to call up the demons. Oh, I wish I had somebody. So, so, so really what the devil wants us to do, he wants us to keep pumping that stuff in our ears. You know what I mean? 97.9. Is it okay? It's okay to listen to rap music, Pastor. You know, it's okay to do that. No, it's not okay to do that because the more you listen to that, the more you lack confidence and the more you are leaning towards demonic activity. You try to justify what you're listening to, but Daniel said, me? As for me? No. I am not going to defile myself with the food. I'm not going to defile myself with the music. And I'm definitely not going to bow down to your God. Watch the text. Text says, and they say, when you hear the music, you got to know the distinction between the music. He says, you are to fall down and worship what? The golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Look at verse 6. It says, but whosoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of what? Blazing fire. 
So how do you break this cycle of insecurity? Go to verse 12. Let me show you the snitches right quick. Whenever you decide to live for God, you got to remember you got you got haters. Pastor told us that right earlier. You, you're going to have critics. Here, here are the here are the haters, the snitches. I call them snitches right here. Well, there's the certain Jews whom were appointed. They went over there and started snitching on them. These were the satraps. It says, whom you have appointed over the administration. In other words, they wanted their job. See, the thing about Daniel, Daniel had the favor of God. He went from the, pil- pe- from the palace, from the pit to the palace. Amen. And now he's in administration. He's working in government. Amen. Watch this. The text says, th- they said in the providence of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods, little G, or worship the image which you have set up. Verses 13 to 15, we find a threat from the king. The king said, I'm going to kill him. And now we get to verse 16. Look what it says. It says, and I'm going to give you a few things to carry away. How do you break the cycle now? You got, you got the point, right? Here's what it says. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we, we ain't got to answer you. We do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. So one of the things I realize about insecurities, if you're not sure who you are and who you serve, basically, you're going to vacillate. You know what vacillate means? One minute you're on this side, the next minute on. Can I ask you something? Whose side you on? You got to decide. So the first thing I want to do, first thing I want to give you, if you're gonna if you're gonna break the cycle, write it down, write it down. First thing you need to do is develop your commitment to God. The reason they answered this way is because they understood that man, I'm committed. I am not, how many of you say you're not turning back? How, how many of you can say, listen, I'm sold out? Come on, somebody. See, when you're not secure in your God, when you, listen, listen, some of us, we say it we're secure. Some of us say we, we, we're with it. But from the first sign of persecution, from the first sign of trouble, come on, somebody. And let me tell you something. The devil is not going to leave you alone. He's just not going to leave you alone. But what you got to understand, when you've made your commitment to him, that's going to keep you Say, I ain't got to answer you. Because I already have a what? A made up mind. Are you with me? When you know that you are committed, you can be secure. You can be like, man, I'm committed. Can I ask you something? What, what would it hurt you? Would it hurt you? Why, why, why are people so reluctant to make commitments to God? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta kinda like probe them and talk to them a certain kind of way or try to, you know, you know, be nice to them to get them to do something for God. But, but, but there's some people who, who say, Pastor, I'm committed. I, I'm so committed that no matter what happens, watch this, because you never know when the enemy is going to strike and you're going to have to make a choice whether or not you're going to serve him or bow down. And I want to tell somebody here today, I ain't bowing down. I believe that it's because of my commitment. That's the reason why I'm so secure in who I am as a man. Are you with me? I'm, I'm so committed in my, to my God that I, that I know that I do not find significance outside of him. I find my strength in him. I find my source in him. Why? Because I know that my commitment to him draws me what? Closer to him. Do I have anybody? Look at the text. The text says in verse 17, it says, now watch verse 17 now. He says, and if it be so, man, do you see the language here? Do you see the language here? He says, now listen, I ain't, I ain't bowing down, but if it be so, let it be what it be. Our God, eh, whom what? Whom we serve. Watch this. 
is can you confidently say today that you believe that God is able? Anybody here know he's able? You see, when you know that he's able, you see, you see, the word here for able in the Hebrew, the word means to, it's, it's in reference to, to, to rescuing or always delivering. Now, now the thing about Daniel, the reason Daniel knew God was able, because at the first part of the book, he was able to allow him to interpret a difficult dream. The reason Daniel knew that God was able, because as you read on in this chapter, God delivered him from the fiery furnace. I got one more for you. The reason Daniel said, because God is able, because God then delivered him from the lion's den. Can I ask anybody anything? Can I ask you a question today? Has God ever delivered you? Do you know that he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think? And can I help somebody with something? Can I tell you something? You will not become a secure person if you're not serving him. So my next point is this. You have to develop your consistency to serve God. Your consistency. Don't just serve him when you're down, y'all. Don't just serve him when you feel like it. Be consistent. Be committed. Be consistent in your service to God. And you will find out. You know how I found out how insecure I was? Is when I started serving with other men in the kingdom. And I realized I was comparing myself. I realized that I was like, man, I want to be like that. I found something I wanted to be like. Come on, somebody. It wasn't a rapper. It wasn't a sports uh, figure. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a celebrity. It was a, just a, a, a simple brother in the church who loved God. Come on, somebody. And I admired that about him. And I said, man, I want to be just like that. And I found out that the closer I got to serving with this brother. Come on, help me. I found out something. I found out that it rubs off on you. And then you start having the same commitment to God. I thank God today, amen, that I haven't forgotten how able he was. He was able to pull me up out of the muck and the mire. He was able to give me, hallelujah, a new mind. He was able to change my heart. But listen, either way go, I know that he's able. Do I have anybody? I love what he says. He says, if it be so. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire. Somebody here today, you're going through the fire. But I want to tell you something. God is able. And you're not exempt from the fire. But when you know him, and when you serve him, I'm talking about serving him with your whole life. The more consistent you are. In your service to God, the more proof you'll have of how able he is. Oh, I wish I had somebody. But some of us have not been consistent in our service because we've been hidden and missing. Hidden and missing. And then you want a consistent blessing. What kind of God is that? Are you with me? The text says, uh, in verse 17, I'm feeling it right now. That, that if it be, it be so, God, who we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire. Watch this. And he, look at the language. Look at, look at the language. Boy, I wish I, boy, listen, I wish I could telegraph this, what I feel. Look what he said. And he will deliver us, not out of the blazing fire, also. Notice, he says he's able to deliver us out of the blazing fire, but then he says he's, he will deliver us out of your hands. Let me tell you something. You got to put the devil on notice. You got to tell the devil, I don't belong to you no more. And no matter whose hands you try to put me in, you may try to set me up, but my God is able. I'm going to say one more time. I said he's able. 
And he can do it for me. Because if he done it before, he can do it again. The text says that he will deliver us. So the next thing you gotta know, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna break this cycle, watch, you ready? You have to develop, you ready? Your confidence in God. That's what I see there. You see, you see, you see, here's the thing. Daniel is a spokesperson. <laughs> watch this. Their confidence was in God. They knew that he was with them and he would never fail them. Here's how it works. Here's how, it, here's how confidence works. Here's how you overcome being insecure all the time. Okay? Watch this. You know you got a million dollars in the bank. You know this. You know this. Right? So you go down and you say, you know what? I want to buy this building. Got a million dollars in the bank. You know the building is $1.5 million though. Right? But you know you have access to the resources. Are you with me? See, you're walking now in your confidence. Ah, you with me? You're like, well, I can go back to the bank and, and possibly get another loan to add to that so we can get this. But watch this. But here have another scenario. You have nothing in the bank. But you know you're dedicated to God. You know you're committed to him. You know you've been living for him. And I'm not talking about play living. I'm talking about for real living. You've seen how able he is. And you walk down to that same place. You say, you know what? I want to get that. You say, do you have the collateral? I'll get it. Let's sign the contract. And let's move on. Because our God, I'm so confident that this is God. That I can walk out on nothing. Oh, I wish I had somebody. I can walk out on nothing and believe. Some of you need to try that. Some of you need to try something that's going to show you. That's what I said earlier about the move of our church. And I believe that God has you here today. In this season, because the next generation that come, they're not going to understand how we got there. The next generation to come and understand, they're just going to slide into church and think, oh, we always been here. But let me say this to you. God has you here in this time so that you can build your confidence to believe that, listen, I may not have a million, Pastor, but I got five dollars. And I believe that five dollars added with that other five dollars can make a difference because anything you put in God's hand, it will triple overnight. You don't have to wait for the stock market. You don't have to wait for Bitcoin to go back up. What you do is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. My confidence in God. My consistency with God. My commitment to God is what has made me the man I am today. Let me tell you something. I still got some insecurities in some other areas. But when it comes down to my God, I am sure that he's going to do this. And I'm trying to help you to build your confidence in him. Because, watch this. If your mind is not set, you're going to keep vacillating. You're thinking one minute, yeah, we can do this. But when you get by yourself now, <laughs> when you start to get by yourself, you start doubting. You start saying, man, I don't know how we're going to. Man, I know he's going to ask for some money. It's a, lot. it's a lot of work. It's a lot. It ain't a lot of work. The Bible said that the, 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 the people had a mind to work. See, and here's the thing. Here's, here's why it's a lot of work. Because you're doing it. But if you do it in his strength, if you do it in his might, the might that he supplies. Are, are y'all following me? Watch this. Watch this. Daniel knew what his God had done before. That's why he could confidently say, hey, God going to deliver me out that fire and he going to deliver me out your hand. All at the same time, bro. 
So uh, if you you know if you think that you're gonna win this, you ain't winning this. Because watch this, Daniel knew God. Can I ask you something? What do you know about him? Okay, all right, okay. He's all right. He woke me up this morning. He started, no, no, I ain't talking about what he done for you, boo. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about do you know him? Do you know his character? Do you know that he's omnipresent? Do you know that he's omniscient? Do you know that he's pure actuality with no potentiality? Do you know that he's Alpha and Omega? Do you know that he sits in eternity, looks down the corridor of time, he sees everything before it happens, and that's why when you pray, things happen because all he wants you to do is acknowledge that he has the power to do it so all you gotta do is lean and depend on him. He wants to know what do you know about me before I drop these millions on you? Because then you're going to get the idea that it's you. But, but see, let me say, you, you ain't going to be entrusted. God's not going to entrust us with nothing more if we don't go through the fire first. Tell your neighbor, I've been through the fire. Some of y'all been through the fire. And you've been refined. And you came out. Watch well, this. You didn't even smell like the fire. Come on, somebody. Because when you came out, you're supposed to smell like burnt chicken. But this one, you came out smelling sweet like Versace. I wish I had somebody. Y'all ain't tell. You came out smelling like Gucci. Because God was on your side. Are you with me? Watch this. Watch the text. Watch the text. Watch the text. Verse 18. Verse 18. Now, verse 18 is key. Now, this is the part that I really love about Daniel. That I can't really say about most Christians. Watch this. All of us got a motive for coming to church. All of us. We got a motive. Some of you want your girl. Some of you want money. Some of you want honey, sugar. Some of you want all kinds of things. We all have a what? A motive. But watch Daniel's motive. Could you say this? Look at verse 18. Look at it for me. What does he say? But even. First class condition. If and it is true. Three class conditions in the the Bible. In the Greek. Hebrew. If and it is true. If it maybe is true. And if and it's not true. This if is as if and is true. Here's what Daniel said. Daniel said, okay, if it happens or if it doesn't happen. Some people, man, you know why it hasn't happened for you yet? Because God knows you can't raise it. You ain't ready to say that. That's why it hadn't happened for you. Because God knows that if it does happen, he ain't going to see you no more. So he says, if it, even if it does not, I ain't there yet. But watch this, write this point down. Here's how you, here's how you change your motive. You ready? You ready? You ready? Develop a Christ-like character. A Christ-like... Listen, when you have a Christ-like character, you're humble. You can sacrifice. Listen, if your life, if, if the tornado come and blow your house away, you're going to lift your hand and say, Lord, I thank you, Lord. I worship you, God. I thank you, Lord, that you gave me this house. You thought enough to take it away, and you're going to give me another one. And, Father, I believe right now in the name of Jesus that all is well. I'm not trying to be super spiritual, but because I have a Christ-like character. Character means something. And there's some people they don't have Christ-like character. And then they try to come into church and fool God. They sit week after week. They sit in church and they never change. Waiting for whatever they came for to happen. I remember when I first got married, my first marriage. 
The only reason I went to church because I was living in hell and I needed some rest. I said, well, if I go to church, maybe my marriage will get better. I went to church and God knew my motive, man. My marriage got worse. I said, dang, this ain't working, so I left. <laughs> Plus, they tried to get me to speak in tongues, and they had me upstairs and like, for like four hours, and I said, okay, because I need a cigarette. I had, I had nicotine withdrawals. They had me up there for four hours trying to speak in tongues, man. Tell your neighbor motive. <laughs> How can you sit under the word of God every single week and you still nasty? You're still deceiving. You're still the same. Nothing is changing about you. Are you really listening? If the word is what it is, how can a 16-year-old boy outdo me? <laughs> Talk about confidence. And look, he's talking to the king. You know what's, you know what's really happening here, right? He's being disrespectful. Culturally, he's being disrespectful. But Daniel had so much confidence in God. How much confidence do you have in him, y'all? Watch this. Whoa, I feel the Holy Ghost. Watch what he says. Watch what he says. I'm about, I'm about to sit down somewhere. He says, let it be known to you, O king. If it happened, verse 18. Or if it don't happen, king. Let it be known to you, O king. That we are not going to serve your gods. Or worship what? The golden image that you have set up. Let me help you. Let me help you with this. Write, write this point down. You have to decide that you will develop a Christian conviction. A lot of us got convictions, but they're not Christian. Listen to this. What are convictions? Convictions are a firmly held belief or opinion. Biblical conviction is really the product of three things. Number one, your commitment to scripture. Number two, watch this, your commitment to scripture and the authority of scripture over your life. In other words, you're not doing anything outside of scripture because you've been convicted by it and it has authority over your life so you're not going to violate it. That's Christian conviction. Watch this. The other thing is it is the construction of specific beliefs watch this about those convictions and beliefs that come based on scripture. Are you with me? And lastly Here's what Christian conviction is. It is the courage to act on those convictions by faith. I got a question to ask you. A lot of us have strong convictions about things, but they're not Christian. A lot of us have strong character, but they're not Christian. A lot of us have strong commitments, but they're not Christian. A lot of us have strong confidence, but they're not Christian. May I ask you a question? What are your convictions? If God says husband of one wife, are you good with that? Come on, somebody. Now, listen, I'm touching it. I'm touching it. I'm touching it now. Amen. Marriage between a man and a woman. Can you stand on that conviction? Can you stand on the conviction that the word of God is living, it's active, that it is the word of God? Can you stand on the conviction of the Trinity? Can you stand on the conviction that Jesus is God? Yeah. Can you stand on the conviction that the Holy Spirit lives in you? Yeah. And if you can stand on those convictions, do you know what that means? You can overcome your insecurities. Listen, male insecurities, female insecurities, 
child insecurities, young adult insecurities, Christian in insecurity. You can overcome all of that. When you go to the movie theater sometimes, they release these movies in 3D. When you walk into the theater, what they do is you receive what's called a pair of glasses, right? If you try to watch the movie without the 3D glasses, you get what's called a distorted picture. No matter how hard you strain to look, you could twist, you could turn, you could eat your popcorn, you can listen, there's still a distortion because of the dimension through which you're looking. Are you with me? By handing you a pair of glasses when you walk into the theater, they give you the tool you need to see the scene without distortion. One of the problems many of us have is that we have a distorted view of life. We see what we see, but we don't see all that's there to be seen. If all you see is the physical, the visual scenario, then you're looking at your situation without the glasses. See, what we really need, we need a divine viewpoint of reference in order to see all that we're really going to see. You see, Daniel saw life through the 3D glasses. He saw his situation. <laughs> he knew he was facing death. As a matter of fact, the king got so mad that he heated up the furnace seven times hotter. And the Bible says that when they threw their clothes in it, 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 it went up in flames even before it hit the bottom. When they were thrown into the lions, into the fiery furnace, the Bible says that the king thought they were dead. But all of a sudden he looked in there and he said, hold on now, I thought there was three of them in there. But there was an angel. See, the, the king needed those 3D glasses to believe what Daniel had been saying. That my God is able. Do I have anybody? That when you throw me in the fire, I got angelic help. See, you're not able to see the angels that's all around me right now. You may think you got me down, but God has some angels all around me. You got to put the right glasses on so you can see what God is doing. Those glasses, those lenses is the word of God. And when you can look at life through those lenses, then you will realize you don't have to walk around with your head down no more. You can be secure in who you are. You don't have to prove nothing to nobody. You don't, have to, you don't have to pump yourself up with nobody. Listen, when you know who you are, I don't have to prove myself to anyone. I used to cast my part. Listen, I was a very insecure person. And then when I came to the kingdom, here's the thing. I was very vulnerable. I was naive. I thought that everybody in church was saved. And I thought every pastor was saved. And then I cast my pearls before swines and they trampled over me. But it didn't turn me. It made me more committed. It made me consistent. It made me confident. It made me Christ-like, my character. And watch this, I had conviction. Listen, when I do something wrong, I feel the conviction. I do not ignore it. If I give my word to you, I'm going to give you my word. You got it. That was a total opposite of man I used to be. Because I have Christian conviction. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap.